everyone. Welcome or welcome back. If you're new here, welcome to the My Science Journey webinar where we do all things science and all things grad school and all things life. And we are very glad to see you today. And for today, we have two exciting sessions. First, we have Julius who will talk to us about PhD in an Ivy League university in the US. Um, and we'll go into that, into all the details about getting in and how it is so far. After which we'll have our second session where we'll have our science journey from Mohammed, who will talk to us about his career in genetic science. So I hope you are excited. You have your questions with you. And if you have questions coming up during the session, just drop them down in the chat or raise your hand and I'll get to you. And please don't forget to write to us on the chat and tell us for your name aim and where you're joining us from. I have not introduced myself, very presumptuous of me. I am Anita Makori. I am joining from Nakuru, Kenya. And I'm joined by Ruth Nanjala, who is joining from the very cold, very grey Oxford, United Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, so to kick us off, Julius, hi, how are you today? Hi, 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 Anita. Thank you for having me. I'm doing well this morning uh, here in Boston. You're very welcome. Thank you. I hope Boston is treating you well. And actually, my first question is about Boston. So having done a master's in Oxford, I think we've had very many o Oxford conversations on this webinar series. I would just like to know what has surprised you the most about being in Boston or doing a PhD in the US compared to studying in the UK for our masters. Oh, uh, that's a good <laughs> that's a good question. Well, I think uh, the UK, specifically Oxford program, is more academic intense, uh, whereas for Harvard, uh, the program is more like holistic. So you have everything happening around, but also time to comprehend everything. I, I, but also, I think it speaks about like the program I'm doing here. Here, it's a PhD where yeah. I have like more than enough time was in the UK. I had a, I was doing my master's program, which was like one year, nine months. So here I feel like more relaxed. So I would say the difference is here. I feel more peaceful. <laughs> Whereas in the wow. UK it was more like, uh, so you begin with this energy. You want everyone wants to be the best. You're like, okay, I want to be the best in the best school. And then in the third week, you're like, I want to survive in this space. <laughs> <laughs> so like you come with all your ego from wherever whichever village or town or city you're coming from and the entire class is like full of intelligent people and you're like well i've been maybe the best in my previous class but now i want to be the best among the best and then in your third week your ego do goes down you're like i just want to pass with a doc i don't really care but i just want to pass so that intensity made it different from harvard harvard is more like was like I have like five years so you get to be kind of relaxed and also because it's a PhD no one cares about your grades anymore you're more focused about your research so it gives you kind of peace of mind to focus on learning than like studying to pass yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you so much for painting that I love picture that. for us you know, you know what yeah is. So you should give more than learning mm -hmm. but I just to pass are you kidding uh, sorry who's speaking I, I I think I muted them. It's fine. Let me go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was saying thank you for painting that picture for us. The juxtaposition between a master's degree and a PhD degree, and not only that, but a difference between studying in the UK and specifically in an institution like Oxford versus Harvard. Because you know, in terms of ranking, Oxford and Harvard are pretty good schools. They are all top ranking schools, but the environment is very different. And I like that we've already started getting into that. But now that that was just the icebreaker to get people um, in the mood, I'd like for you to give us a brief introduction about yourself, just so people know who you are and what your background is before we get into the grad school conversation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anita. I think that's the hardest question for me. Um, <laughs> it's even, for interview, interview. even for interviews as well, for admission interviews, like introduce yourself. Well, uh, my name is Julius Kalisa, I'm Tanzanian Rwandan, um, currently doing a PhD here. And uh, we make a joke like a small school near Boston called Harvard. Uh, before that, I was at Oxford. <laughs> and and, and the, uh, uh, before here, I was working at the, at the UN International Atomic Energy Agency, where I was serving yeah, as a research analyst. 
uh, where I was serving as a research analyst, uh, specifically researching nuclear energy development in Africa. I was in the nuclear energy department, uh, but that's a year I took between Oxford and here. Uh, the purpose was simple. I finished my master's. I, I knew I wanted to do a PhD, but I wanted to be sure like which specific kind of PhD I was going to do and specifically research. So I took a year a gap year to kind of work in the field I thought was interesting to be sure that my PhD was going to be into something that I will like will connect research and practice once I'm done with school. Before that, I was in Rwanda where I worked in the foreign ministry as again as a research analyst. Um, before that, I was lucky to secure a presidential scholarship and um, yeah, so just and besides all this, I'm, I'm in. I'm a simple person. Uh, my background is like we're nomadic pastorists. So uh, fun fact, I only got to eat maybe food and when I was nine at school. So yeah, 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 it was, yeah. So that's like the, the different part from Oxford and all this. Yeah, yeah. When I go back home, you might find me like not dressed, just in the forests. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have that people? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for introducing yourself. And um, you mentioned that you always knew you after your master's, you always knew you wanted to do a PhD. You were just not sure about what exactly, and you decided to take a gap here to gain a bit more of experience and clarity on that. And to pick on that, I wonder why did you decide to go all the way to the US across the pond for a PhD? Yet you are already in Oxford. You might as well have done a PhD in Oxford or the other side that we won't mention. It. Yeah, so why the US instead? Well, uh, good. Uh, so I was reading this book of Rattrell that says that we need to begin somewhere. To be honest, when you're at the application stage, you don't, you're no longer, like it's, well, you're choosing where to apply to, but you're not choosing where to apply to with guaranteed kind of uh, sense of, I'll be admitted. Then that would be egoistic and uh, it's actually impractical for schools like Harvard or Oxford. Even if you, regardless of how, whatever intelligent you could be or how accomplished you could be, you could still apply and be rejected. So that's why, I, and I want to emphasize that intentionally for our audience. So when you apply to any school and you get rejected, it doesn't really mean you're not smart. It's just like, yeah, that time they didn't pick you. So when I was applying both for my master's and for my PhD, I applied to 15 schools. Either masters or PhD, both of them, fifteen schools. For someone who understands a PhD application, they know how that is that, that how that could be like very over demanding. Um, but then the reason for applying to fifteen PhD programs, uh, including five PhD programs in the US and then the rest in the UK and Europe and Asia, was simple. So I had took a year off, um, and then because I took one year off, I didn't want to lose any year. So my purpose was not really any name as a school like Harvard or Oxford. It was more like about my research and uh, wherever, wherever there was a supervisor who could supervise that and resources that could supervise me achieving that, I was fine going to that. And uh, I was more interested in the urgency of time. I didn't want to be like, oh, I'm applying this year and I'll be rejected. Then I'll have to wait another year because I was certain I'm always going to do a PhD. So I was like, the earlier, the better. Um, so I applied to all these schools, Oxford and others. I, I was lucky to be admitted to all of them. Uh, but then they, that's when you get to the point of choice. So now through the application process, you have a big pool. And that also speaks to choices in life or even PhD or master's programs. Start from like nowhere, you know, like ideas could come when you're doing a morning run or in a gym. You, you don't need to be in class or to be talking to a very smart person to have ideas. Your research idea could come when you're just on the way, like, you know, commuting from work to, you know, to, to, to your home or something. So then it's the same thing with the application process. So first of all, the first question was like, what do I want to research? Which schools have that across the world that have the minimum standard measurements that I want? And then I applied to all of them because I'm not the one giving myself because it's like, if all wishes were kind of, uh, we were realizing all our wishes, then beggars would ride white horses. So I applied to many, many schools to increase my chances, um, which worked. All of them got to pick me, but even if I was rejected in a few, I think I would still have higher chances of picking one or getting one pick me. And once I had the offers, then I had way between the US, UK and uh, Europe. Um, and I specifically chose US uh, for three main reasons. One, I had had the experience of the UK in terms of academic and also living experience to um, I think the US PhD program is different from the UK in a way that it gives you enough time. So everything in the UK or specifically in Oxford, you get 
even the application process is different. So when you're applying to US, you write a personal statement and statement of purpose, and that could be enough for your, you know, your application. For the UK, I had to apply like by writing 20 pages of a proposal. And that also defines what you do when you land at school the first day. If you go to school in the UK for the first day, you start writing your dissertation and meeting your supervisor. Here you have two years of taking your time and getting to know the school and take classes and refine your research. And even you're allowed actually to change your research topic. So that kind of uh, the, the freedom of time to kind of think and rethink about your choices and your research topics, having a choice to take classes, either in masters or undergrad and for Harvard they provided the opportunity of taking classes from here or MIT so I have access to both schools uh, so that's in terms of academic kind of content and then the supervisors as well like here you have like a committee of I think six or seven so you have access to many supervisors who you learn from because you're exchanging ideas with them for UK you could still have people to advise you, but the main ones, I think there's always the primary and the secondary, but most of the times it's only the one principal supervisor. So in academic kind of lenses, one is like you have that enough time, so you're not yeah. rushing against time. You have a huge diverse range of professors you're learning from and a privilege of time to choose which one you want to work with. And then for Harvard specifically, you have access to all courses at Harvard and MIT, so you're like studying at two schools. Um, and 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 then in the person in, the, in regards to kind of personal experience and career growth, I had tested the U UK. I had lived in Europe, but I had never been in the US for a long time. So I wanted to have also that kind of embedded experience of having the whole kind of different parts of the world view. And I think I'm getting it here. The school is very diverse. You get to learn about like the US history, um, what we think is good for the rest of the world, and how we're taking everything to the rest of the world. And it's been fun so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Julia. I think you've unpacked a lot of points. And before I get into that, I'd like to welcome anyone who's joined us in the last few minutes. I can see a number of people have joined while we we're having this conversation. If you just joined us, we're having um, our MSJ webinar, obviously, that's why you joined. And we're hosting Julius currently. Um, Julius is currently doing his PhD at Harvard, and he also did a master's at Oxford before that. And we're having a conversation with him about grad school, master's, PhD, UK versus US and all that. So if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we'll get to the Q&A session or raise your hand and I'll pick you to ask your question. And please let us know who you are and where you're joining us from. So Julius, you alluded to several differences between one, the application process itself, between applying for a PhD in the U uh, UK versus applying for a PhD in the US. And you mentioned something um, important about having a research proposal that for the UK, UK applications, you needed to have a research proposal that you'd work on during your PhD or DPhil. But for the US, you did not have to have that. You, you just had to have a personal statement and a statement of purpose. So could you just um, talk a bit more about the personal statement stroke and or statement of purpose for the US applications, what are they, what do they involve, and how different is it from applying in the UK? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think kind of in brief, the entire application process is a bit different. So when you're applying to the US, you need to do the GRE, you need to do, like the, the admission requirements tend to be different, but in uh, then in the UK, it's more like if you've learned studied in the UK before, you need to do the IELTS or TOEFL, but that applies to both countries, um, and that's the admission requirements. Um, but in terms of kind of application content and documents, for the US, they care about much more. I mean, they care about, again, the, the term I use, holistic. So beyond your grades, like you have people like, in the US, I, I, I tend to call it funny. So you have one person who says, I'm going to do nuclear energy research. I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to be like a social worker. So you like you write an essay that seems to be like you're going to solve all problems that exist in the world, uh, even though you're trying to be specific as much as you can. Whereas in the UK, they really want you to be streamlined onto a specific kind of you're just speaking to you. I mean, your personal story, but very bit of that. You're speaking about mainly academics and your research specifically proposal and besides i mean in the uk you still have to submit um specifically for uk personal statement or statement of purpose but besides that they're like additional requirements a writing sample for that even in the us it's required and then a research proposal a research proposal means you have a research question 
you have then you, like schools have different kind of page requirements on how much content you're writing you're either like writing 25 pages 20 pages or 15 pages and some ask 10 of pa um, pages in the us I think the reason they make that a, li a little bit kind of flexible is because they know you're going to stay here for five, six years. So you actually, you're actually going to do an embedded master's on the way. For example, we'll get a master's on the way along, like it's called master's in passing. So they actually pick people. Sometimes I think this is the key important information, like I would love the audience to know. This is something I wish I knew earlier. For the US, you could come straight from undergrad to PhD. You don't need to do a master's. And that explains why they don't expect much from me in terms of a research proposal. For the UK, on the other hand, you not skip a master's. You have to do a master's. And if you've done a master's, you've written a dissertation, they know and they assume your academic kind of skills are a bit advanced. If you've done a master's, definitely you know how to write a research proposal, you know how, you know, to what a research question is, you know, like all this. Um, and then in the US, even though that like the, something that remains here peculiar, even though they don't ask you to provide like um, a research proposal within that statement of purpose, they expect you to focus on academics. So you're, you're, you're gonna have like a structure of SOR by a little bit like first paragraph or like I would say normally I use the structure of 30%. That's all you can do about your person kind of story. And then the rest is about like, I'm going to research this and it's very important and uh, Harvard is the right fit for this because of professor A and B. And then they provide courses this, you go deeper, the workshops, this and this is very important for me because this matches with this. So you start to connect dots around you. You have like the entire ecosystem and the center is Julius. And then you're explaining how everything in Harvard centers to you. Like let's say the center for uh, international development does work, even though it's not in your department, then you're showing them that you've made your homework. You understand everything that's here. You're not coming just for the name Harvard. And then you're like professor, let's say, Professor Ruth, who works on, let's say, small module reactors. Uh, the article specifically, he, she's written on blah, 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 is a very interesting article. And learning directly from this person will be very useful for me to kind of, you know, develop my research and whatever. Um, but even though it's a statement of purpose, you're showing like, I've read, I know what I want, and I know it from day one. I'm not confused and coming to make my mind clear once I get into the, the, the program. So yeah, like to cut like that story short, because I know we have many questions and then soon we'll be leaving. It's kind of, we have like, you, you would draw that binary. In the UK, you need a personal statement uh, or personal essay, or then you have a research proposal, depending on schools, it varies between schools and programs as well. And then you have like IELTS or TOEFL if you've studied outside the UK or non-English speaking country. Sometimes they exempt that. Uh, that's like, depend, it depends on an individual a background. You could get your professor school, right? Like so-and-so is studied all the time in English and is very fluent and they just find that they're fine. But that, don't rely on that. I always try to have everything set. I don't give excuses to people to say no to me. But in case it happens, let it not stop you from applying. Whereas in the US, you need like GRE, again, depending on the school, some schools have started waiving GRE, but most of the big schools, like they'll need you to do GRE, you need to do TOEFL, um, and then you need to have a supervisor in mind. For the UK, again, that's another different. I mean, if you're doing a PhD, it's different from masters. For masters, you don't need to reach out to anyone, but you need to check the names of the professors who are in the school cause they pick you having the ability to bring you in and supervise you. If they don't have someone, let's say, if you want to work on nuclear energy and everyone else who is here is working on, let's say, hydropower. So if they bring, what are they going to do with you? So you want to make sure you do your homework and understand, like, I'm asking for this because there's a professor here. So for the for the UK, you have that kind of, you have, you, you, if you're doing a master's, you don't need to reach out. You just need to check and mention their names. But if you want to do a PhD, you want to reach out actually and secure an appointment and be like, you give your short overview. My name is Julius. I've been working on this. My CVs were ever touched, and uh, uh, I've looked into your research, specifically your work on this, and I've liked the way you. And I was wondering if you could, for the beginning, I would even recommend and say I want you to be my supervisor. I would say like I'd love to learn more about your project and your work. I wonder if you could secure 10, 15 minutes for us to have either a uh, conversation. But if it doesn't work, I'm also fine with emails. So you're trying to put all these buffer zones for kind of not welcoming a no from him because if you say i want to meet and then he's not open to meeting he's gonna say no but you say like in case you can't meet um i'm open to also email exchanges that could help us um and i think yeah in general we'll come back to that but that's the main kind of key st streamlines that keep dividing these two programs yeah
Oh, I think we lost Anita. Anita, can you hear me? No, she. I think the the internet okay, cut off. She's back. Yeah. Hi, so sorry, so sorry about that. No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I had a connection issue on my end. Um, I left when you were speaking about um the reaching out to supervisors. The yeah, yeah. I, I, supervisors. I, I, yeah, I can pick up on that. So I was saying like. If you're doing a PhD, you need to kind of reach out to a supervisor to make sure like even this, sometimes supervisor will take a sabbatical leave. So imagine you apply your strength, the strength of your essay is based on a supervisor called X. And you're like, I would love to work with person X. He's very amazing. His work is blah, blah, he's aligns with my work. And then but that person is on a sabbatical leave. I mean, some of them put it on the website, but sometimes if you've not even read that, you want to know like they're on a sabbatical leave, then you'll be specifically rejected because that supervisor is not there. So you want to make sure you know, uh, like you do your homework, literally. But again, you also have to check like if you're choosing between the two countries. For example, one of the factors I chose the US is funding. Oxford, I mean, Ruth is there, so she can testify. <laughs> yeah, they give you money enough to survive. Uh, you will live an average better life. But yeah, so in the US, they provide more money. Like Harvard does, I mean, they're both very wealthy schools, but Harvard is intentionally generous to PhD students. So it's like, it's like a job. You end up even paying taxes and stuff. So it's a lot of money uh, that you get as a student. And then that gives you a peace of mind uh, for few people who are, let's say my age or older than me, I haven't got married, but even if you would choose to marry, I would say you can not like a very comfortable life, but you would survive. So those are different like individual kind of elements and factors that you, uh, uh, kind of guide you as you choose that, but yeah, uh, let's go ahead. I don't want to kind of focus on one question and because uh, I'll be leaving <laughs> later. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was very mm -hmm. extensive, but I'd like to just to close around the issue of supervisors and potential supervisors. We have a question from Gerald about reaching out to them. So there's measuring them in the statement of purpose, which we have talked about, but what about reaching out to them and especially the Ivy League institution supervisors who are quite busy and don't always respond to emails. So did you have any experience reaching out to them and did they reply? <laughs> Good question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the experience. I want to mention the name of the supervisor, but you get some unwelcome responses and it's not about you. This is the key point I started with. I think we tend to be very harsh to ourselves. You write to someone, someone either, I mean, you could even reach, I'm normally open to helping people. Maybe I, I should even use this time to say like there's next gen for all. You could maybe share it in the chat for people who are interested. And all I'm doing is to share scholarships and opportunities for people so that, um, I mean, I understand the challenges we go through. Uh, when I finished high school, I didn't have a laptop. I didn't know how to use. I remember getting into my undergrad and I didn't know how to use Google Map, which is the best kind of, you know, a cognitive skill for anyone living in the developed world. But this is not your crime. It's not a mistake. But why I'm saying that, regardless of how much someone might want to help you and supervisors, they'll still have to say no to some people and yes to other people. So don't take it as a personal kind of, you'll be like, oh, did I write the email wrong? Or... Uh, uh, sorry, I think I'll help, to, I'll help to mute this one. I've done that. Um, so like you, you get that kind of, you reach out to a supervisor. Some of them will, will be just quiet. They will not even respond. That's them. You'll be lucky if they're just quiet because that's a, a diplomatic no. Um, but personally, I never give up. So I'll reach out. I'll give you two weeks. I'll reach out again. Uh, I'll reach out the third time until you say no. But I'll keep reaching out until the deadline of application goes. And, uh, but again, keep positive through your reminders. Don't be like, I reached out to you and you didn't get back. No, like, thank you very much. I, I, I assume you could be busy, but I had sent an email uh, stating blah, blah. Like always keep positive. Even if someone comes back with a very harsh tone, always be diplomatic. Cause you're, you're the one asking, you, you need to remember the power dynamics here. One is a supervisor, unfortunately. The other one is like, you're coming in as a student. Um, <clears throat> so when I was reaching out to supervisors, I think one of the supervisors who happened, who ended up like picking me for a PhD program, even though I didn't go there. So I, I send an email, um, I give my CV and I tell, and then I'm like, I like your work and this is my research question. He, she goes silent. I was, after like three weeks, I send a reminder and blah, blah. Again, this speaks, you should do this early in time because it gives you that kind of luxury of saying, I can reach out again if, they don't respond on time. And then I reach again out the second time again, silent. I do the third time. 
she responds and the response was very, very <laughs> unexpected. She's like, uh, thank you, Julius, for reaching out. Um, I'm sorry, I don't speak to people who are not yet admitted. Um, I want to focus on my uh, supervisees so that I give them quality time. I wish you good luck in your application. You can read that response in different ways. It gave me two days to process it, okay? Because <laughs> <laughs> it would come out as like, it's a, a if you're, you're very sensitive, you would say this is a no. And indeed, it's a, like, it sounds like a no, you know? But then like I did consultation, and this is another point that I want to advise to our audience. Make sure you speak to many people as possible. My previous uh, supervisor at Oxford used to tell me, more eyes, that get on your paper, the better your paper gets. So make sure more eyes, more ears get to listen to your ideas. And even if they tell you it's a crazy idea, you've had the privilege of saying your idea out loud to an audience, so it's fine. There's no problem with that. So I speak to many people, I'm like, I got this response. I think it's a rude response. What should I do? They're like, well, uh, I think you're being subjective. So we, we speak about like, what could this mean? The analysis was like, you know, like it was as if it's a national security issue. We're like trying to peel, like pin things up there and stuff. And then in the end, I didn't apply to this program until I was done with all the rest of the program. I was like, but now since I have time, let me do it for fun. <laughs> like, I mean, fun of submitting 20 pages, right? I did like, oof, I edited a little bit and then submitted. And this was the application process that took a very swift and fast process I've ever seen. After three weeks, I she invites me for an interview. She's like, D dear Julius, you want to meet and speak about um, yeah, your application? And then we meet. And she's like, I read and I liked your application. Uh, I'd be happy to know more. In the end, like she picks, they pick me in the program. She gets money from her research fund to top up on the scholarship the school is providing. You see? So sometimes really like it takes, you just need to begin. I mean, you just need to begin. And to begin, you need to begin. So you, you see, like, it's an egg-chicken question. To begin, you need to begin. You'll get many no's on the way, but it's fine. Um, so back on reaching out to supervisors, first of all, you want to do your homework first because you don't want to reach out. To... The way you approach me, the reason I was speaking about next gen, I have people who reach out to me. I'm sure Ruth and you share maybe the same experience. Someone texts you. You can imagine how busy schedules we have, and someone is like, hi, Julius. And that's the message. Hi, Julius. Remember, I'm not dating this person. We don't know each other. We've met only on LinkedIn. Hi, Julius. And then I'm like, okay, I know our people. I'm going to try and be as, you know, flexible as people. I'm like, hi, so-and-so. How are you? He's like, I'm fine. How about you? That's already like my 10 minutes is gone. And imagine if I would respond to such types of hi and hey and hi, hey, hey, hi, hi. I'm fine for the next month. Tell me your point, okay? So like, you want to make sure if someone gets an eye to your message, they read something that is useful to yourself. You don't want me to open my LinkedIn and be like, hi, okay. I want to be like, oh, okay, okay. So that even if I decline, I decline you based on the content you've provided me, not because I think like this person is not serious. The same thing applies to supervisors. If you're reaching to a supervisor, if you say like, hi, my name is Julius, how are you? Like, like, I mean, some supervisor will just block that email because they will take it as a spam or something. So make sure if you reach out, you've taken your time. If possible, if you're not as strong as you, you think you are in terms of writing an email, let someone even help you read through your email. Get feedback, then reach out. Because this is like you're betting on someone who is like, if he says no, it might affect your entire application into that department. So you want to make sure you take your time, you do your homework, and then, yeah, send an email. And if they say no, it's not about you. It's about them. It's either your interest didn't align, or sometimes you need maybe to try. And maybe sometimes, like no, like I remember in 2019, I was I was young. I applied to one of I don't want to say the country's got a, it will sound like I'm comparing, but it was the school was a, not as big as Oxford, and the school said no to me. Um, this is like a school that is ranked, I think, 500 in the world. And then the next day I apply to Oxford using the same application materials and Oxford picks me. So again, it's not about you if you're rejected. It's more about like, just take a step back, take a three deep breathers and be like, it's me and I'm going to come back. Like, I'm going to come back until I get it, you know? So, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, I'm 
I'm surprised by how fast time is going, but I wouldn't want us to finish this conversation before talking about the very important topic you brought up briefly, which is money. So you mentioned that funding is better in the US than the UK. Music to my ears, jokes, jokes. But anyway, um, so last uh you you are MasterCard Foundation Scholar at Oxford. And last week we had, um, I mean, last week part one, we had a MasterCard Foundation Scholar who talked a lot about the APOC scholarships at Oxford. So we won't get into that. If anyone in the audience wants to hear about that, check out our YouTube channel for our recording. But I would want us to focus on your PhD funding. So talk to us about how you got funding at Harvard and how that funding package looks like. You don't have to mention the numbers, but just talk to us realistically about how to get funding for a PhD program at Harvard. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Um, so like funding is a very key element for any human being, especially if you're from our continent. Um, and uh, very much gratitude is to the MasterCard uh, scholarship. Like I came to Oxford of the, because of the MasterCard scholarship and I recently, because I took a lesson from them, I've launched like the Cross Harvard Africa Society and we want to advocate and make sure MasterCard comes here as well. Because like, if you're bringing Africans, why do you take us to small universities, right? Like, come on. Uh, so, but Oxford was, first of all, like I would say it's it's a biggest stone, stepping stone that helped me a lot. Because um, when I applied to Oxford and I got in, uh, then that's when I was like, so actually these people, there's something they're seeing in me, right? Because there's that, like, if anyone lies to you or tells you that I he went to Oxford knowing they were going to Oxford, they're being arrogant. Let it be a white, black, went to which high school. Anyone who applies to Oxford doesn't have, like they're not sure like they're gonna get in. So once I got that offer, I was like, okay, this is a very much affirmation by the admission team that they see something in me that I might not see in myself. And uh, that also like pushed me to aim higher when I was applying for PhDs. I could have just applied UK, but I was like, how about I, I become stubborn and apply to all places? Um, and that's how I applied here. In the US, I applied to Virginia Tech, um, MIT, Harvard, um, uh, UC Berkeley. And all these schools were generous to me. Um, but specifically for the US, something I want to make clear, most of the schools, at least all the schools I apply to, they have automatic guaranteed funding for PhD. If you get in, it means you've been, you've been given funding. Um, but for specifically Harvard, uh, the unique kind of uh, opportunity I had and the luck I had, they gave me the presidential scholarship. Um, and um, I think last time I checked, I was, yeah, the only person from our continent. But it's not because it's competitive, it's because people don't apply. Please apply, please. I want to see many Africans from here. I want to see people from Nakuru. I want to see people from Kigoma. I want to see people from, you know, Kampala, Uganda. I want to see people from, you know, Sudan, I want to see people like from Burundi, Congo, everyone come. This space is, you know, let me tell you something that is going to sound rude. There's so much underrepresentation here. Everything is white. Like, yeah, I'll use the term we use here. Everything is white. Like, please come. Let's let's have a cocktail. Please come. Bring your brains. They are needed here. So I was lucky to get this presidential scholarship. I don't think they gave it to me because I was very intelligent but they gave it to me because they were generous um but it all took me like i would say the reason i got it was one it's because i applied so please apply yeah and uh, uh the details of like they give a lot of money i would say like I, I think it's because i just came from the uk they give you money that yeah you you spend you travel home and you still feel like there's enough more to spend so yeah just come and enjoy it <laughs> Sorry, Ruth. Sorry. Ruth but if you have any, it. yeah, because I'm I get really excited, big. I get excited and leave, I go on topic. If you feel like I left something off, just bring mm -hmm, me back to it, mm -hmm. please. Yeah. No, worries. good thing is that we have you, we have you, and we have Next Gen for All, guys. Yeah. If you are not aware, Julius has an organization called Next Gen for All. The link is in the chat. And if you need help with your application or just encouragement, reach out to him on LinkedIn or on Next Gen for All. And um, we have a question from Abigail. Hi, good afternoon. Sorry, um, I joined in a bit late. I had internet connections. Um, so I didn't listen to the first part of um, your journey. <clears throat> I'm currently in the UK and actually seeking for PhD opportunities. I have not done an actual active search to American University. 
I think one or two colleagues had sent me a link to one of the universities. Um, what I just wanted to find out was how easy is it to switch from UK, especially if you've got a master's in the UK, to the American system? What are some of the requirements um, you might need in terms of getting additional, I'm not sure what their um, requirements are for PhD programs, especially if you have a master's from the UK? Thank you, Abigail. Um, first of all, like I would say congratulations. If you're already in the UK, you've, I mean, not in the UK specifically, but if you've already uh, done your master's, it's a great journey and uh, proud of uh, the work you've done. Uh, um, and if you've managed the UK system, the US system is more fun than that, uh, so you're fine. <laughs> I mean, here we study to learn, we don't study to suffer. Like. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't do like that. It's to get to Oxford I think it will be easier so, for you if you, yeah, here is always easier than the UK. I would say like, thank you. <laughs> I would tell you like, I think the difference of how I've recognized between the two countries. You know, like imagine of your time in high school, we had two different smart kids. One who is always like in books, like all he knows is about books. Versus someone who is like, you find him playing football, um, dancing, and then at the same time, he's very good at math, you know, and that's the US. Uh, so he, in the UK, I would um, say like it's very academic intense. At least, I mean, I can speak for, I mean, I didn't go to all schools in the UK, but Oxford was very intense for me, like nine months, like... I don't even remember other streets apart from the way from my house to the library and to school. To be fair, to be fair yeah. Junius, the master's yeah. is more uh, intense, intense than the PhD. Yeah. The PhD is more is a bit flexible. Not not that I'm being defensive, but <laughs> just to put it yeah, like should, you know, should be. <laughs> should be in the UK. UK. <laughs> I mean, I didn't do the PhD. Well, I Again, can attest to Ruth as well. The master's <laughs> is very intensive. I came here during COVID. With a Chinese yeah. scholarship, so it was very yeah. intense. Yeah. Yeah, very intense. But again, that that what Ruth says makes a lot of sense because, like, you have a nine months program versus a two year program. You have a three year PhD versus a six year PhD. That gives yeah. you why explains why one is intense. It's not about like this education system is not good. It's about like the time scope. For example, yeah. that also is a, an advantage that the UK has over the US. If you're in a rush of time, or in Africa we go to school when we are old. I mean. Uh, so if you want to finish earlier to kind of cop up, three years is better than six years. Like, it's a lot. You, If it was work experience, you would be a director of a, a certain kind of company or whatever. So, yeah, there are these kind of different, each side has its own benefits. But back to your question on uh, how do you build up if you want to transition to the U.S.? It depends on what program specifically you want to go in. But I'll tell you, look into the specific admission requirements. But normally the standard ones are Jerry. I think that's the challenging part because most of the people are scared of it. But I did it. I'll tell you, like, it's doable. It's scary, but it's doable. It's like a set in high school. Uh, then since you studied in the UK, thank God you won't have to do the TOEFL and the IELTS, so you're safe, yeah. which yeah. saves you a lot of things. And if you like to get a school that doesn't require, again, if you study like PhD in mathematics, they won't ask for Jerry. That's why I'm saying like you need to check about the specific department requirements and course requirements. If you're doing like, a bachelor's of chemistry, they don't ask that. So it depends on which specific program, uh, a PhD in chemistry, sorry. It depends on which specific program you're doing. Um, then you adjust requirements based on that. Some don't even ask, like, you know, to have a research topic. Some ask you to be, like, specific to a lab that they have. So you want to yeah. check, but I would say, like, the general standard ones. One is you have you need to have your master's. You need to have your personal statement ready. You need to have your jury ready. You need to see if you, there is a supervisor, which is again the ones I I spoke about. But I think if you're already in the UK, you'll be fine. It's almost the same things. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank I have you. more Thank like so five much, minutes. Huh? I have more five minutes yeah. in case there's anything that comes up. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Julius. And um, I'd like to let anyone know who joined a bit late that we usually record our seminars and then we'll post the recording on YouTube in case you need to catch up with the conversation. And we have four minutes and we will we would like to do a group photo before you leave, Julius. So I would allow one question, one quick question from George, and then we do the group photo before you have to leave. Yes, George. Oh, hi, uh, everyone. Um, Julius and Dr. Mohammed, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, That's me. Yeah, so I don't know. I think it's more of like a suggestion. I am also currently doing some applications uh, to the US. And one thing I've come across uh, that's quite 
uh, important is what you say. Is uh, these people like you talking about yourself a lot? And I think that's a component that we miss from our education system. I remember running away from essays a lot because this <laughs> yeah, one that's true. Yeah. And, and I think we mess uh, ourselves up when it comes to that point. So like at a get go, our applications get rejected. I don't know if maybe from this point uh, through your organization, we can come up with like a way, like something that Ruth is doing, but more focused on how to, to, to uh, to put that application together because that's what I'm struggling now personally. Um, there's a specific one I'm applying at Harvard, it's called BIG track or something. I, I can share it, the link, but yes, I think please. that that would be very helpful. Um, for the people who say now you want more people to come and represent the place, it would be nice so that we know how to really put these applications together. I think it's of a request. This is a question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, I, I think you spoke of uh, three main key points. One is pedagogy. The other one is like the existing support mechanisms. And uh, the other one is, yeah, the, 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 specifically the pedagogy gaps back home. So if you look at the um, global education kind of trend or uh, perspective now, is more like training people to be critical thinkers, right? And critical thinkers means like social emotional skills, having like this writing essay. Like, I mean, I think there's a study that was done. I don't, I don't want to mention the names, but then everyone who was like in primary three um, couldn't read a card, a word just cut, you know, like C-A-T, cut. No one could read it. And uh, then for the competence based, oh, like we're teaching people to just pass exams. So if I'm able to just X, Y, da, da, da. If you see the questioning exams, the way they ask here, you find like, it's a math question, but it's more like bubble. You need to think. Like they give you a takeaway exam, but even you can't get an answer when you're away. So it needs you to think and everyone has a different answer. So there's no one answer, right? And uh, that speaks to what you say, like they, it's something like our education system is lacking and I wish they would kind of put more efforts in that. Cause you're training a holistic, you're not training someone to fit in Tanzania, Rwanda or Kenya. This, these days, the world is interconnected. You want to train people to fit into the global knowledge market. Um, and for that to happen, you want to see which skills are kind of fit for the 21st century. Um, um, and uh, glad that you brought that up. And now regarding the existing support mechanisms, I totally agree with you. I think Ruth, I want to commend Ruth and uh, Anita and my son's journey specifically. It's one thing to cross the bridge, you know? Yeah, you cross from wherever you're coming from to where you, we are now or where you are, everyone in their capacity. And it's a second thing to think of where you came from. And Ruth is one of those people who thought where she came from by establishing a platform like this one. And I commend you, Ruth, very much for that. And I wish more people would do it. Um, I think we tend to be, especially young people from our content, to be we sit back and just complain like, oh, the government is not, not doing B, oh, the government is not doing C, oh, they're failing on this. Oh. But in every country that you find that is developed, government works alongside all stakeholders. And stakeholders, when you look at the population in Africa, over 60% were the youth. So if you're like, we're 60%, but we are waiting the support from 40% because we can't do anything for ourselves, you're seeing something from a very interesting perspective. You might want to see or to ask yourself, like, how do I contribute in my capacity? Or begin, like I always do, like individual self-assessment before I criticize other people, before you go like, the government is failing, Ruth is, you know, what am I doing in my capacity, even if I'm in primary six or six? So these kind of questions, and this is the question you raised. Um, I, 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 I kind of anticipate and wish for an Africa where more people open initiatives like the one of Ruth, because, there are people like we have platforms like NextGen. It's doing what specifically you said of guiding people through application and reading their essays and giving them feedback. Existing is one, knowing it exists is two. So people who know me and people who know my network will get to know this. But some people like you who only knew Ruth will never know this exists. And then you miss that opportunity not because you don't deserve it, but because you don't know it exists. So the solution to that is to try to keep what we're doing with Ruth, uh, put as much efforts as we can to make information available. But uh, I think the other part is like, I again, maybe not to this audience, but also to this audience, to open more platforms like this, as many as we can. Because I might not be, I might, 
we are lucky that I'm lucky that I got connected to you, George. But I'm sure there's someone, there's another George in some other part. I don't know. You didn't, I don't remember. I didn't he, listen to the countries you came from. But there's another George in a specific country you're coming from who doesn't know Julius and the support Ruth is providing exists. So, how do we make that kind of transparent and accessible to everyone who deserves it? It's a question that I leave to you as well. But yeah, if you need any help, feel free to kind of reach um, to me. I'll be happy to read and guide you through the process. And yeah. It will be a pleasure to me.